The following is a presentation of Seaside Community Baptist Church. So we're going to through the series of transitions and we are in transitions part four and today we deal with the problem as to we'll go to the crux of the problem of the where does change need to take place take place where do transitions actually occur and that's what we'll try to solve this morning okay where do transitions actually occur do they occur on the outside? Or do transitions occur on the inside? Do they happen on the outside? Or do they happen on the inside? The answer is yes. That's what my wife doesn't like. That's why I like to use that answer. Do you want coffee or tea? Yes. It's one of my favorite answers that annoys her, so I like that. Anyway, so, <laughs> so where do transitions happen? On the outside or on the inside? The answer is both. But transitions need to happen on the inside first in order to make those changes outside. Your heart needs to be ready because the Bible clearly says in Proverbs 23 verse 7, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Your thought life dictates who you are. I read an interesting story uh, just before I came here. It's apparently two dogs went into two different booths. And one dog came smiling, wagging his tail. The other talk, uh, dog came out growling. And apparently the one that went in the one booth, the room, both the rooms were full of mirrors. And the smiling dog thought all the dogs around it were smiling at him, and he was so happy. That's why he came out happy. The other one went very growly and thought every other dog around it was growling at him, and he came out pretty grumpy. And it tells you, I mean, it's a good little picture there where you see your attitude determines how you look at the world many times. The way you see, the way you process information, the glass is, glass is half full or half empty, it's up to you. But that thought process determines who you are. There are times in marriages where you need a break from your wife and the, husband needs, uh, the wife needs a break from the husband because their glass is half empty sometimes. You're in a foul mood. That's what they call it. I think foul mood. Yeah, okay. Where you feel that, man, everything is bad. Everything is, okay, it needs this or that is not properly done. Or, you know, you see that thought process kind of dictates what you say and what you do. So for transitions to occur, there's a problem because we're getting into the core of the issue. And our heart itself needs to be ready to embrace transition. Otherwise, it is very difficult to experience God's will for your life. If you're not ready to receive God's perfect, good, pleasing, and perfect will, we will be kicking and screaming against any form of change that God wants for our life. You with me? So because if you're not ready in your heart, Every transition seems ominous, and everything seems daunting. Because uh, transitions involve something that needs to change on the inside that will result in transformation outside. Or, you know, another way to put it is giving up some things. Transition involves giving up some things or losing some things, but also acquiring or taking up some new aspects for your life. Or gaining some new... Uh, things for your life. So transition involves both. And when we do these things, and as a believer in Christ, it requires unconditional surrender to the will of God. It requires us coming to terms with what God wants for our life. 
And it's not easy if your heart is not prepared. It's not easy to say, Lord, I'm okay with the next phase of my life. It's not easy to come there if our hearts are not prepared. How can we come to the place where we can say, yes, God is in control. I'm ready for this change. You know, the, one of the biggest problems with transitions are, are, is that it's very uncomfortable. Transition involves change, and transition involves entering into zones that are unknown. You'll enter into a phase where you don't know what to expect, and anything which you don't know how to expect, it's pretty daunting and intimidating, isn't it? We are not people, we are not bent upon taking tra- changes easily in our life. It's very hard. When you, especially when there are huge transitions, or we are not that prepared or not, our mindset says, no, it's huge transition and you're a little uncomfortable. And sometimes, you know, there's anxiety that is involved. Sometimes you, there are people who panic for changes. Some people seem to get transitions pretty well. They do it very easily. And some people, it comes very easy, but some people are very much bothered by it. So how do we as believers in Christ make these changes in life where God will move you? As a student, you might come from a small town. All of a sudden, you move to a big city, and now you're in university, and everything is different. Or you're single, now you're married, things are different. Or you lost somebody in your life, and all of a sudden, all you see is emptiness. And you don't know what next, how do you, you'll have this fear, you'll have this anxiety as to how am I going to face tomorrow? How how am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? These changes can happen physically, but most importantly, they happen on the inside. And as believers, how do we handle transitions? How do we accept God's will in our life? Because we know, Bible clearly says, every good and perfect thing comes from God. Let me illustrate it this way, okay? What you see here, are you familiar with this picture? Uh, Now? Not really. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, How about now? uh, Does it look familiar? Okay, there is a hole that was dug here. It's a location in Russia. It's called the Kola Super Deep Bore Hole. This is the deepest hole that was ever dug by man, okay, on this planet. The deepest hole ever is right there. It's capped off now. They dug this hole for 24 years, on and off. And it goes into the depth of 12,289 meters, or approximately 12 kilometers deep. That is deep. Okay, 12 kilometers inside the earth in Russia. And as they were drilling, they found some weird stuff. Around 6 point, um, I think 6.7 kilometers depth, they found some creatures. They call the microfossils. Small, tiny little creatures, 6.5 kilometers down below the earth. Okay, as they tried to go even further down, the pressures were increasing under the earth. And the temperatures were exceeding 180 degrees centigrade, where the bits and everything began to melt, where the rock is almost like plastic inside the earth. So they had to quit, quit what they were doing. But this, till now, remains the deepest hole that was ever dug. But even then, it's only 12 kilometers deep, it's only 0.2% distance from the center of the earth. They haven't even scratched the surface, by the way. No pun intended there. And so they, they just went 12 kilometers. The crust of the earth itself is around 70 to 100 kilometers deep. So they only went 12 kilometers. Now, that's how far they could go. Where am I going with this? You see, every person, there is something that exists on the inside that is not visible on the outside. Okay? So many times, we think we act a certain way and do certain things because we think that's the way we are, and we are influenced by circumstances, and that's how we react. But deep down, you might be surprised that some things that originate in your life could lie 6.7 kilometers deep somewhere in your heart. 
somewhere so deep that you don't even know it exists there. It's very well deeply hidden in your thoughts, in your mindset. And they might be manifest and you act on the surface and you don't realize it has its implications. There might be some fossils down there in your heart that existed before you were born again, okay? The things that you used to do, those remnants, those traces, that sin, those things deep down buried within your heart that you don't even realize is influencing how you behave, is influencing how you live your life. So it's very important to realize there are some creatures down there that are actually hidden very well. There sometimes could be some explosive temperatures that are causing you to explode at times and you don't realize it's coming because of something that is deep within my heart. So these roots in our life dictate how we act externally. The example, I'll give you one example. In India, um, there are people, as you all know, 1.3 billion of them, just a few, right? Like, it's populated, and when you come to the cities, um, they have fights for the airspace when you build homes. Okay, like, right? there's a home, and there's a home next door, and the guy might pull, pull, build his window a little bit upon this guy's turf, okay? So there's some air wars that go on. You can actually go from one house to the other with, very easily. That's India. So when my parents came here, I live uh, in Westwood Hills. It's a whole big space, which I'm not used to. My dad came and he looked through the window of my house, he said, and he said, where are your neighbors? Actually, my neighbor Daryl is there. He, look, he looked at it and says, where are your neighbors? I said, well, it's right there. I said, why is he that far? <laughs> He's not used to the concert. He said, why is he that far? And then I didn't realize every night after we all slept, he used to go and lock the doors carefully so that no thieves or no burglars would enter. He was scared that me and my wife and my kids are living in isolation. For him, he's not a concept because that was a fossil or that was a living creature that was embedded in his thought process. He couldn't c comprehend how Canada has so much space. It's hard for him to wrap his mind around so the things that we do in our life that, is, that are dictated by our upbringing, by circumstances, for our schooling, for all this stuff, they create our thought process, and that influences how we act on our surface. So don't discount anybody by how they behave, because you need to realize there's something deep within. The Bible says the roots need to be dealt with in order to deal with the fruit. If the fruit is bad, the problem is not with the fruit. The, fruit, the problem is with the roots. And you have to deal with the roots in order to deal with the fruit. So in order to make these transitions, it's not just picking up a box and moving to the next scenario of your life. The issue is somewhere deep within. You have to deal with the heart of the issue. As somebody said, the heart of the issue is the issue of the heart. That's true. We got to deal with the issue of our hearts and need to see what is preventing me from making these transitions. But the problem is, we ourselves find it difficult to know what exactly is in our heart. I get scared when people tell me, follow your heart. That's not a good thing to say. You know why? Because Bible says very clearly, um, the heart is deceitful above all things. Your heart is deceitful about, about all things and is beyond cure. And he says, who can understand it? Jeremiah says, I, the Lord, search your heart and examine the mind. There's only one person who understands our heart. That is God himself. If you try to follow your heart, you'll be in big trouble because it's deceiving and it'll mislead you and it needs some cure. So we need God's help. We need God to be allowed to go deep into the recesses of our heart and say, Lord, why is it difficult for me to make these changes in life? Why am I finding it so hard to move on to the next phase? Is there something within me that is holding me captive? Is there some kind of thought process that has been etched for time and time again that I can't even, I don't even realize 
It's influencing my behavior. It's influencing my lifestyle. Once you acknowledge that and ask God's help, God is so gracious to search our hearts, to examine our hearts in order to transform us. How does God examine our hearts? He uses two things. Not a flashlight and a sword, okay? Don't worry, it's not physical sense. In the spiritual sense, he uses the light and the truth. You know, many times when you clean your house, say if all your curtains are closed, you think, ah, oh, yeah, it's a little mess here. It's all dark in there, and you clean the room. And then you turn on the light, it's, oh, I missed a spot, and you clean the room. Next thing you know, you draw the curtains on a beautiful sunny day. You see mess everywhere, Right? What's happening here is the intensity of light is increasing. And as the light increases, you begin to see stuff that you don't want to see. That's what God does. He uses the light. And what does the truth do? The sword? It severs. It separates those areas of darkness in your life. It, it peels off. And how does God do this? He uses light and truth. So what are light and truth? Very simple. Then here is King David praying, O oh Lord, send out your light and truth and lead me and let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling places. In order to make this journey, to know God better, to have a better Christian life as a follower of Christ, there are only two things that are going to lead us, his light and his truth. What is the light? According to the Bible, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. If you want to examine your heart, read the Bible. See what the Bible says. Somebody said, as you search the Bible, apparently the Bible searches you. That's beautiful, isn't it? While you're searching the Bible, the Bible is searching you. It's living. Can you imagine like if all the alphabets are moving in this page? You'll feel it's a living thing. It's not in the practical, physical sense. Spiritually, it's an amazing book, isn't it? There are times where you're going through a hard time and all of a sudden a scripture jumps out. You read that a thousand times before, but in that moment it makes absolute sense and you feel refreshed, revived. As you're examining the word, it becomes a light unto your path in this journey that you're making. So the word is the light. So what's the truth again? The truth is also the word. In John 17, 17, it says, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. So how does light and truth work? They work in tandem. The light shines, the truth severs. The word of God is a double-edged sword. It, it works simultaneously within your heart until the reality of God becomes unavoidable. So in order to have these changes in your life, no person, no counselor can change you, okay? Not, I can tell you 10 things to do. It, it's not going to help you. Only God is the one who knows your heart. Only God is the one who can go into the depths and bring about transformation that only he can do. So it's very important to know and utilize the tools that he has given and God is so bent upon changing your inside so, be, so that there will be transformation on the outside. And that's why King David prays. It's one of my the most beautiful prayers. He says and explains and describes God and says, You desire truth in my inner being. People try to be truthful on the outside. Right? There are a lot of people who try to be truthful on the outside, but inside they may mean something. How are you doing? Good. You know, that's the first cultural shock for me in North America. Hey, how is it going? And before I start, it's actually, and the guy was walking away. So why did you ask me? Hey, how are you? Good. And the guy's gone. He didn't wait for my answer. Do you really want to know how I'm doing? You got five minutes? No. Outside is different from the inside, and God is bent upon changing and bringing that truth on the inside, and it takes some work. You know, one of the things with God is He goes deep down in your heart to do that work. He touches the bottom of your heart. 
And that's why there's a beautiful scripture again. In Psalms it says, deep calls to deep. In the roars of your waterfalls, all your waves and breakers have swept over me. What, what does deep calls to deep mean? You know, sometimes we play, let's have a heart-to-heart conversation. That's exactly what God wants. He wants to have the deep, his depths of his heart, he wants to communicate with your depths. When God asks, how are you, he's not expecting an answer good. He's not, he's not asking that. He's looking right through you. He's looking at the depths of your heart and he undercuts your professions, your doctrines, your assumptions, your pretensions, your illusions, and your traditions, ladies and gentlemen. He cuts through all those. He cuts through your masks, your facade, the Christian mask that we put on at times. He knows how to get through that. You cannot get through, get away from God's examination. God knows the depths of the inward parts. He'll cut away all your formalism. He cuts away all your rituals that you do. He cuts away all the observances and the ceremonies that we do Sunday after Sunday. God is so careful that he gets into the inward parts. What is causing you to be who you are? Let me change it. You know, worship that we do, the songs that we sing, worship that we live, needs to emanate from the inside out, from the depths of our inner being. True living comes from the inside out. It doesn't come just because you're trying to follow the laws and outside mentally. On the surface, you might be an obedient man, but on the inside, you might be a rebel. What is hypocrisy? Is when your inside and the outside don't match. I love you, honey. Really? Do you mean it? Hypocrisy is very heavy in our culture. It tries to pretend to be somebody that you're not. And when your inside and the outside don't match, there's a problem. And God is not going to abandon you that way. God is not going to leave you to that lifestyle. He's going to pursue you into the depths of the inward place of your heart. And he will do a tremendous work of grace and redemption. And during the time that you're allowing him, There will be failures and fallings. You won't be a perfect guy right away, but God will come deep within your heart and he'll meet you there. Why? Why is is God so bent upon changing our heart? Why? Because he wants to input his nature into you. He wants you to make, he wants to make you like Christ, like his son, full of love, full of truth. And that's why God works deeply. He wants us to partake in this divine nature. And His Holy Spirit operates to that extent. He wants you to be free. And the Bible says truth will set you free. And when you're free on the inside, everything in the outside is manageable. You see what I mean? If your heart is ready, you're ready to face anything in this world. But that's why God is bent upon dealing with you on the inside. But here is the problem. We come with all this baggage. Even after we are Christians, you are saved and all this, we have so much baggage that we accumulate during our lifetime. Isn't it? So in order to build something in our life, God is very careful first to uproot, to tear down, to destroy, and to overthrow the works of the enemy. He has to, in order to build something in your life, he has to dismantle what's already existing there. Isn't it? He, that's, that's a part, and pie pack, the part of the package of your carnal nature that you came with. And this light and truth will go deep and he begins to cut off and he's uprooting, tearing down, destroying and overthrowing all these schemes of the enemy. And then he will build and plant his truth, his nature, into your life. And that's how you can make transitions from one zone to to the other. You're with me so far? I'm trying to slowly nail this topic down. I don't want to rush through this, okay? So here is God working thoroughly. But what happens with us? There is a problem. Again, there are problems everywhere, right, (laughs) with our lives. Yes, there's so much baggage we come with before we are saved. And even after we are saved, the few things that fall off, few things that still remain, And they say, we feel guilty about it. We still have to work through those things. But what happens is during the building and planting process, 
all of a sudden we feel that, okay, we reached it. Okay, I think God is finished working with me, and now I'm a, a great guy. I reach, received my enlightenment, so to speak. And we think we've been a Christian for a while. Uh, this is the way it is. This is Christian life. You fail and you fumble and you justify and you explain away all your failings and your compromised Christian walk. And you say, I have reached it. It's almost like you have reached it and there is no further place to go. And you think this is the way Christians are. This is not the state of Christianity. We look at each other and say, okay, uh, he reads the Bible for five minutes. I read for ten minutes. I'm better than this guy. So I'm spiritual enough. It's like uh, that guy kills 10 people, I kill only one, I'm better than that. That's the kind of comparisons we make and becomes relative, Christianity. And to follow Christ, it becomes relative. I'm better than this person, I'm better than the person. Look at, look at that guy sitting there, he didn't lift up his hands during singing. I'm more spiritual. Say, I lift up both my hands. And that guy only lifted up one hand, so I'm more spiritual than the other guy. These things happen through your mind. You begin to compare yourself with each other. You forget that you need to compare yourself with the standard of the Word of God. I need to become like Christ. That's the only standard that God is expecting. God has not drawn a line upon the sand. He has drawn the line and the standard is already established. God is bent upon transforming us and to make us Something that he wants us to be according to his will. He wants us to have a complete victory in our lives. He doesn't want us to be satisfied by where you are. Don't you for a moment think maturity comes with time. Don't you for a moment think in Christianity maturity comes with time. Maturity doesn't come with time. Maturity comes with how much time you spend with God. It's a very important point I'm making. Just because you have been a Christian for 20 years doesn't make you a mature Christian. 20 years doesn't make you that. But you can have five years of intimacy with God, pouring yourself through the Word. You can be mature in a short span of time. That's what maturity is. The sad part is in many churches, there are many Christians still in their diapers. They've been a Christian for a long time, but you have not grown in your walk from milk to meat. And all of a sudden you hear sermons which are hard, and then all of a sudden you say, who changed my formula? That's what happens. Because you're not grown, in the, you know, not ready for the steak. What does Paul say? Go from milk to meat. What's the difference? Milk is a product of the cow. Steak is cow itself. You're still living off byproducts, books about the Bible, but you're not reading the Bible. Listening to somebody's sermon like some pastor, Kamal, or some guy, rather than asking God and seeking His word for your life, Lord, teach me, show me the scriptures. It's not about the persons and the followers of people, ladies and gentlemen, we got to avoid that. You need to hear from God. Teach me, talk to me, show me your ways. Maturity. We need to grow in God's nature. Don't you for a moment think that you've grown. There's one guy in India who was a very good friend. One, one day he came to me and said, uh, Come on, I think I've grown. Now I'm, I'm done. I'm grown as a Christian. I'm like, What do you mean you're done? <laughs> I was like, I know everything there is to know about Christ. Really? You grow till you die. You know, you grow till your death, but you grow even in eternity in the understanding and the knowledge of Christ. It's an unending process. This is a journey we are all making. Don't you for a moment think that you made it. Because you know what the Bible says? There is a battle between God and our flesh. And our flesh constantly says, you reached it. God says, no, you didn't. Why? Bible is very clear. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable are His ways. Do you like the word riches? It's right there. God has so many riches that you and I, He wants you and I to partake in. You go to the King of kings and the Lord of lords and ask for a penny. 
and you're satisfied with it. How does the king feel, basically? So I'm here to give uh, my kingdom and this and that and everything. And you go to the king. King, can I have a penny if you don't mind? Just a little. Oh, Lord, please, just a penny. Will, you know? And the king is like insulted. Okay, when will this guy learn? I have riches of wisdom and understanding as far beyond your comprehension. It's unsearchable. Do you know what I got for you? I didn't just die for you on the cross. There's a lot more that I accomplished upon the cross for you. Come and partake in the inheritance through Christ. That's what God is saying. And we think we have reached, and I think I continue to live with the mindset of a penny. This is my lifestyle. This is the life of a Christian. I got to continue to live miserably during this lifetime. Oh, I believe in Jesus. I don't do bad things. That's a lifestyle. Where is the joy? Where is the life that is abundant? Where is the hope? All these things are missing. Because your flesh is acting up. It's fighting against your spirit. This is what the Bible clearly says. It's true. We all go through this. It says, walk in the spirit. Capital S, the Holy Spirit. And you shall not fulfill the lusts of your flesh. The flesh, flesh lusts against the spirit. And the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another. So that you cannot do the things that you would. You would. This is what... A normal person's life is before they are saved. Every individual on this planet has a body, this physical body that you're looking at, and the soul, which is the real you. Every person has that. But before you were born again, your spirit is dead. You're dead in your trespasses and sins. That's what it means. But when you're born again, all of a sudden your spirit becomes alive. And all of a sudden, with the Holy Spirit, you begin to comprehend the things of God. You'll begin to experience His life. Oh, it's so beautiful. All of a sudden, you know, you remember that born again experience? Where all of a sudden, life looks a lot more meaningful, a lot more hopeful. It's not just related to the body and soul. But this is what happens as you continue to grow. There's a conflict that develops between the spirit and the body. The spirit of the living, there's a small s in the Bible, that is your spirit, and the capital S is the Holy Spirit. Don't get confused, okay? God will say, Come on, it's time for you to pray. And your body says, You are exhausted. And it's cold if you take your blankets off and you turn off the heater in your blanket, you will be freezing. That's what my flesh will say. There's a conflict. God wants me to pray, and my flesh says, no, come home. Enjoy the warm blanket. I really do enjoy my warm blanket, by the way. There is a conflict that happens constantly. A good fight begins. A conflict that happens in your soul, and your soul has to decide, am I going to yield to God, or am I going to yield to my flesh? That's always the whole Christian walk is this. The more you yield to God, the more you'll experience His riches. The more you yield to your flesh, you'll remain where you are. And all that matters to you is what pleases this flesh. Please this body, put on nice makeup, put on you know, nice clothes on it and take it elsewhere where it's warm. It's all about the body. Please it. But if you're of the Spirit, you can have your Disney vacations in your prayer room. You can experience the presence of God, absolutely lost in the presence of God. And all of a sudden, what just happened? I had a glimpse of eternity. I've seen the goodness of God. The life and the joy and this peace is unexplainable that comes deep within, from the deep, the depths of God's heart, input into your heart. And that is more satisfying than anything the world can offer. And God is saying, this is what I have in store for you. But there is this inward conflict. Remember this, ladies and gentlemen. If there is a conflict in your life between pleasing God and pleasing your flesh, it's actually a good indicator. It's not a bad thing. It tells that you have a relationship with God, basically. So isn't that a good thing? If you don't feel conviction for sin, then we have a problem. If you go to a guy who's getting drunk in a bar and say, hey, you are sinning against God, a guy will look at you like, are you nuts? I'm having a good time. That's what the guy will say. But if it's a born-again believer who's all of a sudden yielded to his weakness and he's getting drunk secretly, 
And you say, what are you doing? You're sinning against God. You'll feel the conviction. Yeah, I messed up. I feel the conviction. You see what I mean? When you're truly born again, there is a conflict that happens. And that conflict is a good thing. It's called conviction, not condemnation. God is gracious enough to show you those areas. And sometimes it's very hard to know how to fight this battle. Because the world, the Bible says, is very clear. All that's in this world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, boastful pride of life. This is not from the Father, but this is from this world. And there are some areas that are very visible. The lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. These are the things that consume many people's lives. But God is gracious enough to send us His Spirit of truth, the Bible says. Again, truth. It's all over the Scriptures. When he, the spirit of truth, that is the Holy Spirit, he, he comes, he will guide you into all truth. Why does truth matter to God? Because truth is the only way you can overcome the lies in your life. If you live with a, uh, uh, a reluctant attitude, it's like, no, there's nothing wrong with me. We have a problem. But with God, he says, I'll keep bringing the truth until you admit it. And once you admit, at least we can do something about it. If a person says, I have no problem, you can't help him. If he thinks there's nothing wrong in his life, you can't help him. But if he says, yeah, things are falling apart, can you help? Absolutely. You know, um, the little kids, when they're hungry, you know, when they cry, little babies, when they, you, know, you try to decipher those cries and you try to bring them food. But if you're 20 years old and you're hungry and you're sitting at the dining table and you're crying... There's something wrong with the picture, isn't it? I say, Mommy, I'm hungry. Is there something to eat? You expect maturity. You expect words. But if you don't say things with God, you don't admit and allow this truth to come out of your life, there's nothing anybody can do. You need to be open and honest with God in all the areas of your life. And that's how things happen. Here is a process. Here is how it happens. Here is your heart and my heart. That's our heart. Some little black spaces in there. Here and there. Those are the dark areas that we don't know about. God examines, sheds his light, and brings about this. Oh, man, look at my heart. It's filthy. When this light shines, you'll see it. And you'll find little gremlins there, happily smiling at you. These are the things that have been living there for a long time. You didn't even realize I'm not a greedy guy. I don't have any issues in my life. I'm a good guy. And God says, no, let me show you. Shines this thousand watt bulb upon your heart. And all of a sudden you see these things. And say, oh man, this is dirty. And then the battle begins. The flesh and the spirit. There's only two ways. You either want to admit that and say, God, yeah, that's true. It's me. And God says, okay, son, that's good. Now let's work on it. Or you can deny it. You can say, oh, no, that's normal. That's the way we do it here, kind of stuff. You can gradually smother it and make that uh, truth a lie in your life and become callous in that area. As time goes, you keep telling yourself, and you'll be okay. Oh, there's nothing wrong with me. Or you can make that change. But because of the conflict between the flesh and the spirit, many times this is what a Christian life is. Oh, Lord, yeah, this is true. I want to change, but I can't. That's what exactly Paul went through. He says this, For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Paul recognizes, Oh, man, there are these gremlins in my life, but I want to change, but I'm not able to. Why? Because of the conflict. This conflict is very real in every Christian's life. You know, uh, friends, when you're born again, God, God's standards come into your life. And when you love somebody, you need to love better than what the world does. The world says, I love you. It's different than what God says, what love is. His love is unconditional. His love towards him and towards others need to be sacrificial. 
It needs to hurt when you give. That's the kind of Christianity. That's what it is to be a follower of Christ, where you deny yourself of all your appetites and everything that you think you need. Your lifestyle should be different from what the world does. If you go to your neighbor's house and they're, they're, what do they desire in their life? A nice house, nice car, nice family, everything healthy, live long, you know, buy a boat, retire. You know, that's what... And if your prayers are like, Lord, give me nice life, nice house, nice cars, and good retirement, and buy a little boat, how are you any different from what the world is? How are you any different? Where is that selfless lifestyle? Where is the life of sacrifice? Where is the life of, Lord, I abandon myself to you and to your purposes? You know, time and time again, when I praise God, I say, God, I give my family into your hands. I give what all I possess into your hands. I have to keep saying that again and again with God. I have to keep surrendering because I'm very good at grabbing onto things. I, I, I like what I got, <laughs> and I need to test myself. Do I, can I live without, can I live without this, without that? You know, God really wants to examine your life. Not, God is not a killjoy. He's not bent upon making your life miserable. Never mistake him for that. He always has something better to trade. That's what you need to understand. He always has something excellent and better because he is your father who gives good things, Bible says. And when God considers it good, it's worth it. But many times we think this is the best thing for my life and this is the best, Lord. You don't know this deal I got. God says, no, I got something better. Wait patiently. God keeps telling that, but we have this tendency to go through this battle. What I want to do, I do not want to because you have these affections that you're bound to. The conflict is a lot deeper than what we imagine. It's way different from what the world is. You know, world tries to be good. The world, people are generous. People are kind. People are loving. But that doesn't make them godly. It makes them good people. It doesn't make them godly. To be a godly person is to depend upon Christ for everything. It's through him the goodness is imparted into your life. We, our righteous acts are like filthy rags, says the Bible. We are not good in ourselves. Only God is good. Just because you do a little bit of charity doesn't make you a godly person. It makes you a good person. But we need to, in order to be godly, we need to step up the game. We need to have the Spirit of God to lead us into a place of abandonment to the will and the ways of God. It's a lot deeper. And God is bent upon making you that person who lives a life of abandonment. That's the key. The Holy Spirit comes into your life. He'll remove all these areas in order to make you an overcomer. Because the Bible clearly says, apart from him, we can do nothing. If you want to be a good guy, you cannot be a good guy without God's help. If you want to be generous, you cannot be generous without God's help. If you want to be kind and your words to be smooth and soft and life imparting, it cannot happen without God's help. For everything, we need to lean on him and lean on his righteousness. So this is the process let me break it down into steps and we'll wrap it up here. So you're a new born again Christian. And when you are saved, you know, there are few areas of your life of sin that are very hard to overcome. God gave you victory. But there are few things that still remain and you don't even realize that they're within you. You don't even realize that they're still clinging on those little things. And but, you know, maybe bitterness or anger or lust or greed, whatever those areas are, they're still clinging on to you somewhere. And you feel the defeat constantly. These hidden areas are there in your life. And sometimes they're obvious. Sometimes they're not. Oh, I know my sin. You know, I know it very well. We all know. But there's some things deep within that we don't even realize is the reason for how you're behaving on the outside. And God says, and you're in all these areas are there, but you're, you, now your desire is to grow in God. You're a new born again on fire Christian guy. And say, Lord, make me like you. Help me to grow in maturity. And God says, sure, son, I'll shine the light upon your life. What happens when light shines? As you're seeking God and you want to get closer to him, the light increases in, this, in its intensity. Then all of a sudden, you're looking at your heart. It's like, Lord, it's filthy. I have all these areas and all these things that are so messed up. You're confronted with the truth of the light. 
you're confronted with the reality of who you actually are deep within because god is showing you he's just holding the mirror in front of you it's like what every morning i wake up and look my at myself in the mirror it's kind of like a little surprising wow i don't know why my, my wife married me right i say that to my i told her many times she says you're handsome i said thank you thank you, <laughs> you said that right yeah my <laughs> or maybe i'm imagining things <laughs> anyway the light shines your heart becomes visible and you begin to see you know what happens when god confronts you with his truth shame comes strangely you know you know it's like oh man i'm this bad i'm this dirty i can't even talk to another believer i have to pretend this is the real me but don't you for a moment forget God is not bent upon shaming your life. God is not bent upon making your life miserable. Ha ha, look at you, miserable fellow. No, that's not God. No, not at all. Because you were seeking him. Because you had the desire as a Lord, I want to know you. God is saying, "Oh, I'm a holy God, you're a sinful man, but I love you so much and you not to get together to become one you and I. Let's deal with these areas, son." when you remove these areas you can come a lot closer that's what god is bent upon and he's showing you these things not so you feel ashamed and condemned he's showing you these things so that you can cry out to him and say god yeah help me i'm a mess so there's a choice we all have to make god shone this light in my heart i can see this sin that's so deep within there's a choice to make you either admit it or you deny it you can live in denial if you want there's nothing there or i am all fine god you are wrong you know the times when in your pray you feel in your spirit that i'm greedy god god you know place on you come on you're a greedy guy so no there's no way lord i'm not i'm pretty generous i try to argue that's an indian thing to do all right so i try to argue with god and say no 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 that's not me then you see you know what happens God puts me in a situation where my greed becomes visible. It's not uh, with like money or anything. It could be some spicy Indian chicken that I like that somebody comes to my house and my wife gives it away to the guy. Whoever comes, that's what I was saving for for 12 o'clock tonight for my snack. And that's gone. But I can't express that. And then all of a sudden God taps your shoulder and say, "I told you. I told you you are greedy." I was like, yeah, I got caught. There's a choice to make. When God shows you the depths of your heart, it's like, yeah, you know what? These areas are there in my life. I need to change. You know what happens next? You got to confess and you got to repent. These two, you don't talk about in Christianity much nowadays. You got to confess. You say, yeah, Lord, I'm lost. I'm weak. I'm I'm a failure. I'm sorry. I repent of my ways. How many people I've ripped them off before in my life? I'm, please forgive me i'm sorry i admit every one of them god says son that's okay let's use the word of god and he uses the truth the sword these are the god's promises that will come into your life use them and this truth will sever that areas of your life sever every area of your life. use the word of god say lord i'm a critical thinker i don't have much grace confess that before god and use the word of god and say lord you promised you'll fill my speech with grace you'll fill my life with joy that's the kingdom of god kingdom of god is righteousness peace and joy so i need to experience use that truth that sword as a weapon to sever the ties with what your flesh is saying that's how the truth operates but the best part is this it is god who fights on your behalf He doesn't just point something at you for you to fix it. He doesn't say son you have this problem is I can't do anything you fix. No he doesn't do that. <laughs> he says I will fight on your behalf. The battle is mine the victory is yours. I will fight. I will lift up a standard. He's looking for you. You know what he's looking for? God has sometimes his expectations are very minimal. All he wants you to do is admit and be willing to change. 
He's not saying you need to be able to do this yourself. No, he says, I'm the one who empowers you. I'm the one who enables you to become an overcomer. That's my God. Because I cannot fix myself. Can you? No, we can't. We're all a bunch of people who have different issues. And we need God's help. But we are ashamed and we are, you know, we can't to repent, hard to confess. We don't know what's going to happen. What am I going to lose? That's all you're thinking about. When I get closer to God, what, what's going to happen in my life? You know, it's like lying down on a surgery table where God begins to work. And as you allow yourself as a Lord, okay, I'll lay still. You be God. I won't interfere with your ways. You know what he does? He breaks you. That's his way of doing things. He breaks you. During this moment of brokenness, you will feel God has made your life miserable. This is the time where, when God will just rip apart those insides, just like a surgery. And a doctor is standing over you with a knife. Yeah, it feels bad. It feels, doesn't look good. When God is working, he needs to cut, but he also needs to heal. He can heal you. He will heal you, but he needs to do that surgery to remove those dark areas in your life. And that's what brokenness is. Unless you break, unless he breaks you, the contents inside you cannot come out. They've been there for too long. They're stinking. They're stagnant. They gather all kinds of junk, and God has to break you to remove those things. And brokenness is a part of the process and when God strips you of all these things, truth, ladies and gentlemen, it hurts. It hurts. That's a fact. Truth hurts, doesn't it? Truth about ourselves, it hurts. But God's truth hurts, but it makes you broken. And when you're broken, he can actually work on you and empower you. That's the time the Holy Spirit Lord will begin to build your life after removing all the stuff. It begins to build your life. You know, and then slowly but surely, there is an assurance that comes with, within you that God is working within your heart. This is what the Bible says. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You know how powerful that statement is? God, who is completely another, all by himself, the creator of the ends of the earth, he calls us his children. Then all of a sudden, your spirit acknowledges that. Like God has not left me destitute. He's working, he's breaking me. He's working deep within my life. He's not abandoned me. That kind of love, your spirit will begin to bear witness that you are the children of God. In 2 Timothy it says, if we be dead with him, we also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The process of living comes through dying. That's the only way it can happen. Dying to ourself. God needs to break you and put to death the deeds of our flesh. And that's how you can be alive to the Spirit of God. You'll begin to comprehend what all He has for you. And all of a sudden, you'll be so satisfied and content in Him, you will not desire for anything else in your life. As I'm coming to a conclusion, I like to say this. We are living in times where Bible clearly says people will not love truth. People within the churches, they will not love truth. And in Thessalonians, it says, 2 Thessalonians 2.12, who do not believe in the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. First thing to accept is, Lord... I know truth hurts, but I want to receive it. I want to accept it. Give me the heart to receive your truth. Do you love truth in your life? The Bible says it's better to have uh, the slap from a friend than the kisses of the enemy. It's so true. We don't, I like to surround myself with people who say, how great of a guy you are. You know, I like those people. Oh, what a great sermon. But someone says, hey, there's too much of yourself in there. So I don't like that guy. <laughs> right? It's like who's always criticizing me. You don't, you don't want to surround your, surround your... Yeah, I'm not saying surround yourself with a bunch of critics who put you down. No, that's not what I'm saying. There's some people who truly love you. 
you can see the motives, you can see their heart behind what they say. And when they say it in grace and truth, it won't hurt you much. It'll actually make you feel good as a thank you for being honest with me. They say that because, you know, if you tell your kid, don't take candy from strangers, doesn't mean you're mean to your kid. You're telling that for their safety. My mom is so mean, she doesn't want me to take candy from the strangers. No, they say that because it's the good thing to do for your sake. And God is saying, yes, the truth is this. And son, if you receive this, it will be well with you. You can experience the freedom that I've achieved for you. So it's very important, ladies and gentlemen, that you love truth no matter what the cost. And I prayed that prayer and I experienced something, exactly what I showed you. God took me through all this and he still takes me through all these things. And this truth hurts. I say, okay, Lord, show me the truth. I don't want to see, but show me. Because I don't like it. I don't like it when God tells me you're a mess. You know, I was like, oh, man, I thought I was getting better. <laughs> Look at your heart. It's, God doesn't do that to put me down. It's only so that I can get better, to live a better life, to live a good life, to experience him for who he is. So truth is very precious. So grab onto it. Accumulate people who speak truth into your lives. Go to churches where truth is spoken and surround yourself with godly people who speak truth constantly in your life. Because the problem is the heart. Only God wants to get into the depths of your heart and bring about this transformation. You need to allow him. That's why Joel prophesies and says this. Yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments. Rend your heart, not your garments. What does that mean? Don't tear your clothes and pretend you are grieving or pretend you are sorry and repenting. No, don't do it externally. Rend your hearts, not your garments. Now return to the Lord your God for His gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and relenting of evil. God is so faithful if only we acknowledge the truth and come to Him. So can you have the guts to pray this prayer and say, Lord, Show me for who I am. Do you have the guts to pray that prayer? Show me for who I am. Because in my own eyes, I think I'm a good guy. You know, some people, I'm, I'm a good guy. I don't do, I'm better than, you know, Al-Qaeda. I'm better than that, right? Then that, that's not the means of compassion. Lord, show me according to your standards. What am I? Examine me, Lord. Search my heart. Know me. Set me free from me. Deliver me from where I am. And Lord, I have been held captive to my ways and to my thoughts. And that is why I'm not able to make these transitions in my life. So help me. Set me free so that I can enter the next phase. Otherwise, I'll keep looking back to Egypt and saying, Oh, we had it good back there in Egypt, Lord. I don't know what promised land you're talking about. And we'll keep complaining. We'll be good complainers. But if your heart is ready to receive God, what God has for you next, you'll be delighting in the ways of God because you already trusted Him enough. And He did the work in you so much that you'll now know Him for who He is. And you say, I'm ready to walk with my daddy. I'm ready to walk with my God because the Bible says and promises that He's going to lead me and guide me. And that will become reality, a reality in your life. All that God wants is... He wants to draw you closer to Him. He wants to show you how good He is. Get out of the mindset of what you're going to lose during this transition. And get in your minds what you're going to gain because of this transition. When you're walking in the will of God, you will be gaining. You'll be growing from strength to strength, from glory to glory. And the assurance within your heart is so strong that you will be ready to take that next step. But if that assurance is not there in your heart, you will not. You will be faltering, fumbling, testing the waters and coming back. You will not be sure about where God is. You will not be sure about all His promises in the Bible. You don't know whether He can lead you or guide you. You don't know whether you can trust Him. But only God can remove the lies that we've been living out of our lives. 
The sad part is we don't even know what those lies are many times. But God is willing, you know, that he can remove these lies out. Give us a believing and a loving, a prayerful, a tender, a watchful, a humble, a broken and a contrite and a sincere heart to make these transitions. And when these chains are broken, you are free. You are free because your heart is now willing to walk with your God. Your heart is free because you trust in the wisdom and understanding of who your God is with the full assurance of faith. That's what the Bible calls the full assurance of the faith. If God calls you to be a missionary somewhere in Baghdad, Iraq, and all of a sudden you feel, oh man, why does he want to call me there? I'm going to circumstances, if they dictate you, there's a problem. But deep within your heart, it's, that's where God calls you. You know that's where God calls you. And because you have grown in intimacy with God, have grown stronger and stronger in your walk with God, you will say, if that's the will of God for my life, that is the best place to be. It could be the most disastrous place, but if God wants you to be there, that's where you'll be. So pray to understand God's will for your life deep in your heart, then outside situations will get better. Because as you think, you'll act. Look at Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. Three times he prayed, he said, Lord, let this cup pass from me. Jesus didn't win the battle upon the cross. He won it actually a few hours before in the garden itself. And he said, not my will, Lord, but your will be done. And when he came to terms with it, he was ready to undergo the process. He brought his mind under subjection to Christ. And what followed next was uh, smooth in a way where it's not like not painful and all that, but he was ready to endure but he had to win it on his knees first. So go through this process. Rend your hearts, not your garments, because deep within, God is going to make a thorough work. And all these things that have held you captive, they're going to fall off, and you can experience God for who he is. Amen? Did that make sense this morning? All right? All right. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, uh, this morning time, We'll try to pray this prayer with some guts. We want truth in our lives. The truth that sets us free. But we're also afraid that this truth is going to hurt and we know it will. So we allow you to examine our hearts. Because our thoughts are yielded to our flesh and not to your spirit majority of the time. And we shake and we panic and we fret about, just like the world does, there's no difference. Would you please help us to change our lifestyle? Help us to change those ways deep within our hearts that have been embedded and ingrained for years and decades of the past. Oh God, help us to be free so that we can make these transitions easier in our life. We don't know where the future will take us, but we know you hold our future. But that's the assurance we want in our hearts, God. We don't understand how you hold the future or where you'll take us, but can you take us to a place of abandonment to your will and to your ways, where we know you that you're good, kind, merciful, gentle God who's bent upon doing good in our lives. Help us to come to that place where we know that your ways are just and they're perfect. And the Bible calls your will is good for us. Your plans for us are to prosper, not to harm. That's what the Bible says. But many times we tend to keep clinging on to these areas of our life, thinking that they're the best. Forgive us, O oh Lord. So we want to step out of our boat this morning and say, we love your truth. It's very hard for us to say it, Lord, but we do. And we don't want to compromise and remain in a place where um, we are comfortable. But come to the place of your will and be satisfied where you put us. 
Lord, if we have the spirit of complaining, I pray that the spirit would be removed. Help us to look to the hope within us, deep within us, that you are given that life eternal, the joy that is overflowing. And Father, help us to look to the future with excitement, knowing that you are in charge of our life, O oh God. You're not asking us to fix ourselves here in all the areas of our life. You said you're going to help and you sent us, sent us a helper, the comforter and the counselor of the Holy Spirit. You've given us somebody, help us to make ourselves familiar with the person of the Holy Spirit. And help us to allow him to do a thorough work deep within us so that we will not live a lifestyle that is pitiable and miserable. Holy Spirit, Lord, open our eyes that we may see our God who is bent upon loving us in spite of us, who loves us so unconditionally and who is so faithful to do his good pleasure within us. So God, help us to look to you. This morning, I pray, Lord, for your supernatural assurance in each and every heart who is sitting in this room. Help us to have this assurance that it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay tomorrow. Help us to have this assurance that can only come by your spirit, not by wise and intellectual words, by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the assurance and the comfort that comes from your word, your truth, and your light. I pray that you'd assure people at Seaside this morning that it's going to be okay. Whatever the area of their life they might be struggling, whatever area, Father God, may there be an assurance that tomorrow is going to be all right. Because you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And the Bible says, he who has begun the good work will see it to completion. Father, you are faithful. And we abandon ourselves to your hands because we know we can't do it on our own. When we look at things through our flesh, we don't know how we are going to face tomorrow. But when we look at things through your spirit, Father, there is life and there is hope. May these words be etched into each and every one of our lives. And may we walk with every step in the confidence of who you are. And God, we believe in the living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who has been there turning history and making history time and time again. No man, no flesh can save us besides you. And Father, help us to draw near to you with clean hands and a clean heart. And may your light and truth lead us to the place where you dwell. Give you all the glory and honor, Father, for the truth that has penetrated our inward parts this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us. Hopefully this teaching has blessed you today. Trust you will join us weekly in pursuing God through His Word. You can join us at seasidecommunity.org, Facebook, or via YouTube. We always enjoy our listeners' feedback, so send your comments and prayer requests to info at seasidecommunity.org, for we would love to hear from you. And now, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, 